in a mystic meeting, we consider four functions in special. Four functions. The director of the meeting. The people that, are, that communicate the spirits, that we call them ostensive mediums, either speaking or writing, so psychophonic or psychographic medium. And we have the counselors, which are the ones who are going to speak or counsel, speak to the mediums who are giving the passive facility of the spirits, and then we have the assistants or pass givers. Some groups we have people only in assistance. They don't communicate with the spirits, they don't give passivity, but they're there to offer good vibrations, offer spiritual assistance, or some say, think legato, sustenance or support mediums. In the end of every communication that the person gives, they receive a pass. Or they give a pass in specific situations when the medium is not able to continue their task or have some issue. But generally speaking, four functions. The director, the assistants, the ostensive mediums, and the counselors. Each of these functions has a certain criteria to them so that they can we can evaluate the development. I, f I finish uh, the membership meeting, I'm going to say, oh, I really like the meeting. I thought it was really wonderful. But based on what that I liked or thought it was good, I need to evaluate and have certain criteria to follow. It's not like a race that I get at the end and then evaluate myself. Did I get there tired or well to see if I had a good or bad development? The function of the mediumship is something much more important collaborated as compared to a race because at the end of it if I feel good it was good or if, it, or if at the end I don't feel good it wasn't good we need to have a lot of bigger criteria more elaborate criteria all the volunteers in the spiritist group that I'm a part of they each have a notebook of self-evaluation and each one does their own evaluation and we have a certain a list of criteria concentration fluidity regularity and diversity of communicating and other criteria that are in so they each have in their notebook the items so that they can self-evaluate and to say how am I doing in concentration? It was good, it wasn't good. As far as fluidity, how did I go? As far as consistency and the facts. And each one can evaluate themselves so that at the end I can say, today, my development was quite, quite good. My performance is quite good. The spirits in the mystic meaning come and they give a communication. They're not under criteria of evaluation. What we are evaluating is my development in relationship to that spirit. If I was able to be a good intermediary of the spirit, if I was able to speak adequately to, with the spirit, if I was able as a director, able to organize the work of the human, I'm not there to evaluate the cases. It's like a doctor that in their own development evaluation is going to see what is the development of their own functions, not of the patient, the performance. In the the doctor and the same thing. I need to have criteria that are clear for evaluating my performance. Does that make sense? So, regarding the medium, we can think of, of psychophony or channeling or in, in the majority of situations or automatic writing or psychography. So there are five or six or seven items I don't remember really. As time passes, I change it. And the majority of the criteria, it's found in the book in the end of the
quality in mediumistic practice in the project Mano Filum Energy Midanda, which is not translated yet. But in the middle of the text, we're able to extract these items. The first item is concentration. Me, providing a communication from a spirit, need to evaluate how was my concentration. What does that mean, evaluate my concentration? The agility to get into contact, to capture. When I arrive in the meeting, the spirits are already there. If I'm not really feeling anything, <laughs> tell, me, tell, tell me if I'm like not looking very well in my appearance on my sweater. So if the spirits are already there, and I come into the meeting and I don't really capture anything, it's because my concentration wasn't good. Because my mind is, wasn't working. It was, it was in other concerns, which are nothing to do with the present. Because if I were really present, I, I would be able to capture the spirits that are already there. So in order to be able to get into contact, contact is really to capture the presence of the spirits is an important criteria. Oh, this person gave a communication, this person gave a communication. But this is a good criteria for evaluating. You're not hearing anything? Can you hear Hello, us? hello. Testing, testing. We got this connector here. Hello, hello. Testing, 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 testing. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Testing, testing. See if it's connected there. Yeah, it's going, going. All right. Sorry. We weren't speaking really anything important. <laughs> to capture is an element. To communicate it is another element. I don't need to have to agility to communicate. Well, we need to affix well in the attunement. I begin to feel the impressions, maybe a headache, like my headache, my head's going to explode. So I capture initially the sensation. I need to allow some time for my peri spirit to impregnate itself with the air and energies of the spirit that's going to be arriving and communicating. So it's almost like I need to listen well, really attune well with the spirit in order to be able to talk. It's not like I'm in the work and, I, and see who's going to start talking faster. Because then there's something wrong. It's in the sense of really being able to capture the influence. And then I'll be able to get into contact if it's the moment to talk or not. But the agility to be able to get into contact, contact is an item of concentration. And it's the whole expression of the message. There are communications where I retain the sensations, but I can't really have the thoughts that are clear in order to express the communication. There are communications where I have the thoughts, oh, I, I killed myself, but I'm not really feeling any sensations, or I'm not really feeling the emotion of the suicide. It doesn't mean that it's not a communication of a suicide, but it has to do with I'm not really able to concentrate and express or feel and express the sensations, the emotions, and the thoughts of the spirit. Are you able to distinguish these? So sometimes when the person is saying that they're suicide, we don't really see any painful, any pains or any significant emotion. But it doesn't really mean that it's a mystification or that it's not a spirit of a suicide. Sometimes it's a matter of concentration of the medium. The medium is not very concentrated, can't really capture with all these possibilities, and therefore can't express with greater depth or richness of details. So that's a problem of concentration. Is the first item clear regarding concentration?
fluidity or flow has to do with the ability to establish the communication. So we're talking really in the sense of to establish and maintain the communication. We're going to notice here that the message is clear, it flows smoothly, seamless. I don't really have to think a lot about the words, I don't have to really think in what I'm going to say. The sensation is as if I'm going to just open my mouth and it just rolls out of me. Or if I'm just writing, I'm not, I am not really don't have to think a lot punctuation and stuff. It really just slips out of me very freely. So when I get to the end of the communication, I noticed that when I started it, I didn't have any idea of how it was going to end because that was really flowing out. That's the fluidity. Within fluidity, we need to evaluate. That's what the counselor is going to That's where we're going to evaluate, to help if there are phrases that are repetitive or phrases that are chopped off. There are spirits that are lost or confused, and it's from the spirit that he has those chopped up sentences from his confusion, etc. But sometimes the medium is messed up or is not able to make the communication flow seamless. And we can notice that a lot in psychography, repetitive sentences, same terms, sometimes same sentences that are complicated to understand because it's, is, there, is it a retarded spirit? No, it's a medium that on account of his lack of ability of concentration and surrendering to the phenomena is not able to achieve this fluidity ability to grasp the troubles of the communicating spirit, which doesn't mean wait for the story to arrive complete in my head. So I feel like a piercing pain in my heart. And it doesn't help for me to stay, what is this? Is it me? Is it not me? Oh my God, what is this? And I can just keep questioning, questioning or dwelling. That's not what we're talking about. The ability to understand the, the troubles of the communicating spirit is because sometimes I feel the pain in my heart and it starts to become clear in my mind what that problem is. If it's a heart attack, if it's a bull, bullet gun, if it's anguish, I don't need to make an effort to ask myself what it is. It's simply, I just simply perceive or apprehend I'm able to grasp the logic. This works for either psychophony or psychography. I don't know where this is leading to, but I have been able to capture the sensations or the, the, the outcome of the message before it materializes itself in front of me. All of that has to do with the fluidity. So I could have a good concentration because I was able to rapidly con enter into contact and I was able to fully express the sensations, emotions and thoughts but maybe things didn't really flow because it was interrupted, the thoughts was truncated, the sensations were too intense, the emotions or the words. When it came time to talk, I wouldn't really I wasn't able to find the best words. Sometimes I repeated myself or I kept going back to the same sentence. Concentration was good, but fluidity may not have been good. Two different items. Clear? Consistency in the practice has to do with long silences that characterize a loss of attunement. And this we can think about in a group as well as individually. In the group, you don't expect that there are moments without communication because we already have a very limited time. There are many spirits that are needing to be guided. When we have those long moments of silence, it signals that there's something for the group to examine. Or when I'm there and I would have the possibility to give the communication and I don't, 
It sometimes has to do with, like, I felt someone coming close. But when I, when I was about to start talking, some other medium started talking. Well, what if after they finished? Oh, well, then it was too late. So there's that hole of silence. So that has to do with this consistency or regularity in the exercise. Because I'm not able to maintain this consistency in the task. Because I only achieve some peaks peaks of attunement, so which has to do in the quantity of communication that are established by the group. Here you don't do simultaneous communications, right? So it really doesn't matter in this case, and individually also. So there are mediums that in one day, if allowed, they will give three communications or three, four spirits, and other week, might be one communication and doesn't feel the approach of anything else. Is it because there were no spirits there? Obviously not. It's because that consistency in the practice is, jeopard is being jeopardized. Maybe it's good concentration that they ha can have, but this regularity in this exercise or the practice can be faulty for other reasons. Sometimes you could have like an unbalance during the week, or have some kind of uh, issue with the feelings towards the group or not feeling comfortable with the group. It can be some, some rivalry or some problem. This interrupts the regularity or the consistency, even though I might be in a good concentration mode. I try to compare, contrast, so that you can think of the different ones. Because when the practice ends, there are many criteria to evaluate. To really know, was the work good or not? Are you following? Diversity of the communicating spirits. It's another criteria of evaluation. Because the same medium has to learn to communicate different types of spirits, obsessors, simple situations of discarnations that need simple guidance, different types of personalities or temperaments, spirits that are more aggressive versus more that are intolerant. I mentioned, I mentioned these uh, fanatic religious intolerance or, or independence. Of course, that the spirits are going to bring to the mediums according to the mediums' profiles. But I need, although there is a common characteristic, to be able to transit through different types of communications. Because when I'm not able to transit through different types of communications, it's very probable that my anemic content is so great that I provide the same tone or the same colors to the communications. So there's always something more introverted or something that a softer voice or maybe something more silent. This doesn't have to do that the spirits that are communicating are like that. It's very likely that I as a medium am giving my colors and inks that are very intense and that's providing the same types of communications. Well, that medium is always that talk to him, whisper through him. That's not from the spirits. It's from the medium that is not really uh, working on his development. So the medium that always whispers and then there's medium that more exalted that scream. So the exalted spirits come to him and the low, soft-spoken spirits come to him. The other medium. That's not a rule. If the soft spoken medium never receives a loud spirit, that's a question mark that we need to investigate. Why? Because maybe the medium the, the, the medium is giving those characteristics. Sometimes a spirit who is not very rowdy, but because I'm a medium who's very rowdy. It's, it's I, I act like that. If the spirit would go, wow, what's going on here? I'm not acting like that. But the medium goes, what kind of foolishness is this? This is called mystification in this 
that I'm adulterating the characteristics of the spirit. Not mystification in a pejorative way of lying or of fooling, but I'm adulterating the characteristic of the communication. And there, it's tough for us to talk about this because so that we so that we don't go okay then I must give communications of more calm spirit or more soft spoken or more rowdy since Marlon mentioned the different types of spirit I must be able to give communications of diverse spirit then comes a rowdy one and I pretend that he's more calm in order to be in the different types of temperaments so now you made a really even big mistake because you were because you make the mistake for being born etc this is a criteria for evaluation we can't take the criteria against our development when I notice that the same type of temperament that predominates in the communication me as a medium I'm not going to make an effort to give different types of communication I'm going to make an effort in meditation in discipline of my moral I'm going to invest in my relationship with the group I'm going to talk about this that I identify so that something can begin to transform inside of me and it can reflect itself in the different types of temperaments but it can't be a really a choice of the medium otherwise we are adulterating it twice in this case in respect to the mediums more beginners could it be that there's some kind of a characteristic given the ease of attunement that they have with those spirits? They're always going to be a characteristic that, even for those that are more advanced, because if there is an ex a rowdy spirit that wants to give a communication, and you are introverted and he's extroverted, who do the spirits uh, bring so that they can able to express themselves better to the medium who's rowdy that's logical but suddenly when he's not able to capture uh, when he's not able to give the communication from different types of spirits then there's something to be concerned but it's it can't be uh, um, just that we need to time and time again get in touch with all the other types of characteristics of spirits when jo João is not there at the meeting, for example, then nobody can communicate rowdy spirits, for example. We need to have a predominant characteristic, but we're going to, time and time, end up disciplined medium. They are able to handle different types of profiles of spirits. We also notice that there are mediums when the spirit comes, the medium just cries, cries. This, I notice that frequently. <coughs> so sensation, emotion, and thought, because the individual sometimes captures the sensations, but can't really translate into words. This is a question of the medium to become more disciplined. When I understand this, I'm able to arrange with the medium as a counselor. I arrange that I'm going to insist a little bit more as a counselor so that the medium doesn't get anxious in the communication to say, listen, we're noticing that in some communications you have this difficulty to express your thoughts. So I would like to encourage you to, in this manner, to ask, well, what are you thinking? What are you thinking that you're not going to say? And I'm going to ask again to really get you to make this exercise of translate into words. Otherwise, you just say, oh, that medium that only cries. And we don't really demand more from the medium to make this effort. So I know the medium has this challenge. I'm going to say, please, describe in one word what you're feeling. Maybe he can't put up a whole sentence, but perhaps one word, anguish, period. So we're beginning to, to stimulate the medium in its development or performance. What we can't is to put the medium in a comfort zone. Oh, we already know that he has that challenge. And then we just talk to the counselor 
gives the intuition and then demands that he has the same performance of another medium. So we need to pull, pull him a little bit, pull him up a little bit. One's going to speak with the other medium is not going to speak. Why are the two of them going to speak at the same time? Because the spiritual plane is disorganized. And left you know, it up to you guys, whoever speaks first. No, right? There was an order here that she would speak first, and then the other one speaks. But when we are not well balanced in this area, the two speak at once. Because it was for her a little bit to wait a little bit, and she wasn't able to do that exercise of concentration and fixation. And this one was already to start speaking. And this one was his turn to start talking. It took too long, and the other one started speaking at the same time. Whenever we have these conflicts, this is not a drama, this is not a huge problem. Oh my god, who made the mistake? It's not, this is not the issue here. It's just that someone who's not able to be, be in sync to concentrate. Because the spiritual realm is not going to leave it up to the, you guys and beings. Leave it up to you. Like, who's going to speak first? Because we have a perfectly organized uh, work by the spirit realm. So when there's a problem in the order and the organization, it shows us there's something, there's an issue here, rather it, it's the superior spirits speaking with or it's a matter of the mediums, a matter of orientation. When you have this kind of conflict, it's a sign that there's someone, and we can't tell who, someone's not following the order. And at the end of the day, at the end of the work, we're going to just say, oh, I think I was taking too long because I felt a little insecure. I wasn't sure if she should talk or not. And then the spiritual plane saw that she was not, she was having some trouble, and then they approximated another spirit to a different uh, medium. We're not looking for criminal. We're just saying that this is a criteria. It shows that there's something here that got in the way of the work. One of the things that could possibly happen is even when the counselor, I can say to you that rarely there is a medium communicating, and then we notice that another one is ready to give a communication at the same time. And then we realize this case takes a little bit longer for the spirit to communicate. So we say, well, this, how do we do this? This is enough. Well, sometimes the counselor took a little too long and it wasn't able to follow the timing. This could happen as well. This is true. That as you work one at a time, you have to finish that one before another one starts. I hadn't thought about that in those situations. We get on all mixed up. We do carry a little bit of pressure because it was a little difficult. So it's a good thing to think about the order because what comes up is that because the other one can say, well, I felt it was the right time for me to communicate, but then I was a little bit uh, feeling like some things weren't flowing. So it helps the group reorganize. Some spirits that come at the end, I don't know if you notice this, some spirits that come at the end of the work, and they really want to take longer and longer, and this and that, and, and an, hour, uh, an hour reading, I'm like this, cut, that's it, that's enough, that's enough. If you really want to speak, you can come back next week, no, no, but just one more thing I want to say, well, it's okay, we have time to finish, you know, because otherwise the spirits come to just really really uh, just extend things for too long and then, and then we start extending the work and then the groups and the spirits see that we're not being able to handle the work they just go this is it we're gonna yeah, this is how we do it cut it there's one that was like uh, what kind of like uh, rambling rambling okay when we start, they start rambling we just go cut it's enough that's also a situation. 
that's like about four mediums ready to give communication with me before when I was in a meeting there was only three mediums now there are nights as there's eight of us so the spirit comes and sometimes it's very hard to maintain this connection especially for me I say this because it's very strong you want to help you want to give the communication you're doing your your part of the job this is what sometimes could also be a sign that the group needs to uh, take a different look at how reevaluate how they're doing the communication because we might not want to do things different way but then the spirit realm is allowing us to things to happen so that the mediums can be like listen I almost talked on, uh, while they were talking we saw this happening repeatedly repeatedly and it could be a sign an invitation from the spiritual realm for us to change the structure Adilson Adilson Fala mais alto, por favor, para a gente captar na tradução. I'm asking him if he can expand a little bit more about simultaneous communications, because this is a consideration that we have in the near future in our center. Today, well, maybe about 10 years ago, I'm talking about Brazil, we didn't talk about simultaneous communications, and the groups that did this used to be looked at upon as a mess. But recently, Devaldo Francos are talking about having two communications at once in groups in which we organize ourselves on the table in a certain way. Of course, we're going to be careful enough that if we're here on one side of the table, we're not going to have communication one next to the other so that they're so close. So one side of the, the table gives a communication, the other side gives a different communication. But on that same table, we are going to create a separation, two hemispheres, so to speak, two communicating at once. And the pr project of Manuel Filomeno de Miranda from the Valdo Center. In the latest edition, they, they talk now about three simultaneous uh, communications, a certain criteria, three communications when they're simple cases. The person is discarnated and they're not aware that they're dead, they need a little bit of orientation, something simple. Two communications when we're talking about an, an obsessive issue, only one communication when it's a really severe obs obs obsession case, so we need everybody to stop and focus on that. So this is not me speaking. Our group, we work with this logic of three communications at once. And generally speaking, when it comes with this more severe obsessive case in our reality, most of the time, is, and usually happens towards the end of the, the work of the night, no one else feels the approximation of spirits, and it comes and we're all ready and already in vibrations, ready for this to work with this case. Maybe so in a matter of transition, it might be helpful to start with two and then and see how that works. Later, you can start with these two separate in the group. You can have the, the counselors in the middle or on the sides, depending on the table, the characteristics of the group. And then half this way and half the other, concentrated on the other side. And then if we have three or four mediums, three or four mediums on the other side. One give a communication on this side, we, the other's weight, and one gives on the other side, and the other's weight. So I believe that for you that work for a long time with just one, you don't need to think about three, think about two. And there's not very big groups, right? You said there were like 14 of you in your minimistic group? We shouldn't go too far forward, about 14 to 15 people, not too many more than that. The problem is that it's not, there's not a restriction. I've seen some groups that works with one medium, a little table, and the council, a bunch of people around, massive orientations. The, matter, the issue is keeping this attunement with the group. So, 
so the issue becomes in, in groups that they cannot keep this attunement. As for some, for some people, uh, ten, ten might be too much because they cannot keep these ties of affection amongst the ten. For, for other people, well, for us in our spiritist home, we work with the depression treatment. So once a month, everybody participates in a monastic meeting, and the other three weeks, we assist the people, and only few people stay in the monastic group. So only when there's a few, when the group is small, there's only eight of them, when everybody's there, then we were about 16 or 18. I don't remember, but it's quite a few people. But a group that has very strong ties, good affinity, we all know each other well, we have an intimate relationship with one another, we do monthly meetings, so it's not large in the sense that we are able to maintain this unity. How long have we been working together? Some of us have been working together for 14 years. The most recent ones to join have joined about three years ago. But we really invest in a relationship of the group. I was telling you, Sara, that once a month we do a gathering. It's not just a talk and wasting, talking about the news or wasting our time. Our, our gatherings are long, sometimes it's from 7 to midnight, sometimes we leave 1 o'clock in the morning. Everything is very well organized, 7, 7.30, we begin what we call a portal. So we do we do a drawing of a raffle and, and a certain someone's name comes up. We uh, Marlon's name comes up and he sits there in the group and first he does a presentation of who he is, blah blah blah. Whatever you think is important for others know about my life. And we stay there for about an hour um, talking about that person, asking about a bunch of things about them that in our day to day lives we don't have a chance to. How did you start the, the doctrine? What are the challenges of your life? What was your biggest pain? However, way the person, depending on the person, we're going to start asking the questions. We ask how did the group help or get in the way of that person's life. At any moment, they feel uh, challenged. And then the person has an opportunity to open their heart. And this was beautiful. There was one time someone spoke so many things that we had, could never expect. And there was a posture of so much welcoming and embrace. So we really invest in relationship. So about three months ago, we did this experience in which we all took a piece of paper. Each one of us put ourselves in the middle. And we put each person in the group as a circle around us. So we think, who do I think is close circles further away from me? And each person does their scheme, their organization. Everyone in the table, we pass the table around, we say, wow, I thought I was close to so-and-so. And they put me really far away from them. And there are some people that forgot some members of the group. And they say, oh my gosh, five people forgot about me. And now we start to talk about these things why we forgot, what is the relationship with the person with the group. There's one person that I talked to her and I said, she said, guys, this experience was wonderful because I thought I was the it, that I was the center of the attention of everybody's lives and I realized I'm not that important to everybody's life as much as I thought. And she started to invest in these relationships with the other people. And she would say, some people that are important to me and I'm really far out front for them that they view me, so I wasn't able to show clear, wasn't made, made it clear to them how important I am to them, so I need to invest in those relationships. So someone in the group said, well, who are you talking about? Who do you think you're, is important to you that, that you're not close to them? And the person said, you're one of them. She said, well, well I, I miss having you around. Well, well, let's have coffee tomorrow. And the next day, they were already having coffee together, and from then on, they were scheduling things. And started. So this is an investment in a relationship with the group. The more the group can maintain this relationship of intimacy, the more they're gonna better they're gonna work together. So the more they can go, the group can grow physically. So if you can't really do this and you need less people. How are we gonna talk about animism, mystification? How are we gonna do an evaluation 
And how do I want to say something to you when you're not going to be offended? If we don't have this close relationship, there's no way. Because an evaluation becomes aggressive, it becomes a matter of conflict, disrespect. Yeah, oh my gosh, so and so thinks I'm mystification. Who does he think he is? In his face. And I'm going to say him outside, not in the group. And me with all the people of the group that I coordinate, I'm so sure that I can say, talk about fascination. It was one that I didn't have to talk. I said to her, listen, this is what I see. I see this and I see that. You're in the line of fascination. I'm Marlon, you think so? Yes, I think so. Pay attention. Because all of a sudden you're here thinking that you're all that. And it's, this is not going to work. Go and meditate on that. She, the next week she came back to me. She said, Marlon, I started to see my thoughts. And I think I really was entering a fascination. Because I'm going to confess to the group that I was feeling better than the other mediums. Because my case was more complicated. My communications were more complicated. My, I was being more intense. I wasn't noticing that this was making me weaker. It needs to be this affection. So that one coordinator can be, bring this up the participant not feel disrespected and be able to assume to to admit that they felt better than others if there isn't an emotional closeness to the group then it is not going to work when you start to noticing someone is distancing themselves from the group who do you think at that moment should be the one to have this conversation is it a collective thing? Is it, some, is it an individual communication? Such a notice someone is not get, not opening up, is slowly kind of distancing themselves. This dialogue is not happening with ease. How does that work? I think that's already a sign of another issue. Somebody doesn't want to open up to the group is a signal sign to something else, either because they felt rejected by the group or because they're being fearful of being evaluated or judged, because it's an instinct of the human being, this, this, huh? this, this gregarious feeling. So when someone who doesn't want to be a part of the group doesn't want to share, there's something to that. Fear of being exposed, fear of being exposed, also show that they're fear of what others will think of them. So there are people that we many times are not able to show to them how important they are to us, how much we love them, independent of their, their, their mystic development, how important they are to us, independent of their characteristics. So they're going to be fearful of the group talking about the problem because they're afraid of being rejected. They're afraid of being excluded. And sometimes it's not just fear, sometimes it's a fact. Our mediumistic group were able to talk about some very intimate things. People that are living their personal dramas, and we all do. And the group, the music group, ends up being the main support system to these people. I see that the intimacy that I have my immunist group, I don't have with a lot of people in my family, for example, because we're here together. How are they going to be able to help me? an obsessive issue. So I don't even know about my own personal emotional challenges in life. So, and what, what sense does it make for us to be working there together if, if we don't know of each other's dramas? I always remember about this girl that all of this in the end of the evaluation she said, guys, I am very close to cheating my husband because I have an ex-boyfriend who lived outside of Brazil. He's coming back. We're already scheduled. We're going to get together. We're going to have coffee. I don't know when. And I am very close to cheating on my husband. If a group inside a ministry meeting and inside a spiritist group is not there to help a person like this, who will? And then we want to talk to her about this. What we could do, and in the end, we created a, a, a tragedy that was a tragedy. We created a plan that was great. We sent her messages all the time. How's it going? So, no, no, I'm well. I'm focused. I'm concentrated. And look how interesting that one of the people from our group who's very sensitive, she decided to call 
suddenly. Because we said we will only text her. So that we're not too invasive. She decided to call her instead. And when she called, she said, So and so, I'm so glad you called. Because I was already getting lost in my thoughts. And just hearing your voice, it was like I remembered why am I here? What is my commitment on earth? And I'm going to say goodbye and I'm leaving. Look how wonderful. This is evangelization. This is mediumship in action. This is moral transformation. So we're in the mediumist group to transform form ourselves to help and to grow. If it's not going to be for that kind of thing, that is, we don't need a mediumistic group. So it's an investment. This group in this moment, at this moment of the situation, this group, we were together studying for two years, and when she brought this up, we still had about five years of practice already, so we were together for seven years. In the two years that we were studying, in the other five years of practice, we used to meet every month. Every month somebody talked about their lives, every month during some, some interpersonal development, every month was talking about each other, developing this effect, this union amongst ourselves, these ties. One of the meetings we said, what are the most, three most important things in your lives? And then we met, and then we would order pizza, and then gathering, because everything has to have food, right? Pizza, lasagna, you name it. The creativity. Where we, where we came, we scheduled a pizza from now, from now so we could do these activities. So talk about what the most important things, what's the biggest challenge of your life that you have need to, to grow. This is fantastic because we don't know about the dreams of the person. There was someone in our group that was, that was thinking about committing suicide and we, we didn't know that. And we found out through this kind of situation, we did exercises of positive and negative points that you see about <laughs> each other. This took a whole afternoon, we took the group, and then I had to take you and I said, what do I see positive about you, or what do I see negative about you? And then so and so and so and so, each person, each person talk, wrote about each and every person, and then we would take this paper, everyone giving your opinion, what they think negative, positive about you, and you would take this with you. This is fantastic. In order to be able to get to seven years of being able to open up without fear, they're about to cheat on their significant other. Because depending on the group, they're going to say, that, oh my God, but aren't you a spiritist? How dare you think about cheating on your husband? Can you take? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll give it to you. Hold on. Hold on. Conflicts, doubts, and inhibitions. It's something that dissolves itself when we have these conflicts. When we, because I'm afraid of exposing myself. I'm afraid of placing these doubts or venting. We're not like fearful of what people are going to think and say. A lot is dissolved by these interactions that I mentioned. He really needs to notice if he in, is inhibiting the communication or not. If he's placing in doubt. Sometimes I'm in the middle of the communication and a doubt comes in my mind. Is it really a spirit or is it me? Is it... Sometimes I'm messing the communication when I do that. So I need to notice the conflicts that I place, the doubts and the inhibitions. We're going to go until midnight, right? That's, that's <laughs> until we're going, midnight? We're going to do another break. <laughs> and after we can, afterwards we continue. <laughs> These are the criteria of the medium. <coughs> as well as psychography or psychophony. Do you guys have many, any questions or doubts that you want to add? Anything to complement? Otherwise, we're going to talk about the counselors. <laughs> what criteria, now that you're more warmed up, what are the criteria that you think that a counselor needs to have in order to determine if they accomplished their task that night or not? So concentration, yes. What else do you guys think? How, if they were helpful or not? 
to the spirit to change the vibratory pattern, perhaps, if you brought the gospel to the counseling, to the conversation, or if you were talking about what you think, like my brother, you need to calm down, you need to calm down. You didn't have to come to a medium, mystic meeting to hear, you need to calm down, you need to have faith, you need to detach. You didn't have to come to a medium, mystic meeting for that. To be able to hear more than speak. To be compassionate. To be compassionate, non judgmental. You guys are good, you guys are smart, sharp. To be a good observer. In what way, as an observer? The communication itself, body language, the voice. They're going to allow us to recognize what's coming from. Because sometimes the counselor doesn't really see anything. The counselor generally has a profile of more rationality with love, the moral condition, kindness, moral stability, because we can't speak of what we don't believe in. Not as far as you know, we live in our personal life. Because we, if we really practiced what we preached, we wouldn't be on earth. <laughs> but the condition, the moral condition, is to talk about what we believe in. Because when I go through my pains and sorrows in my life, I need to believe that they have a reason for being. So that when that spirit is going through that experience of abandonment, my word can touch him. But there is a reason for being. If I don't believe in that, then I can't have that moral condition to be able to touch him or move him. If I don't believe that the gospel of Jesus must be the reference in my life, I won't be able to compel the spirit to believe that. I don't really live the gospel of Jesus. For a little less, for like 80%, I don't, I don't live it. We don't live the gospel 100%, but we believe that that's the path. Without this belief, without this certainty, there's no way. Knowledge of the Spirit is doctrine. Doctrine, I'm talking about the Spirit is doctrine, a little more regarding the concepts, to understand the problems of the individual could be the evangelical question of the gospel. Well, the, when I had the issue with the individual, I'm talking in the sense of somebody dies. You died. And then you're on the other side. You have no awareness that you died. What happened? Did you just erase that part of having died? Did that just vanish? Do you not remember? How do we explain that a spirit lives the experience of death of the physical body and cannot recall it or have the awareness that they died? How do you explain that? Do they just wander around, go back home and don't have the awareness that died? How do you explain it? If he, ex if he went through physical death, did you not understand the question or you don't know the answer? As duas coisas. Could it be that the spirit is temporarily perturbed or disturbed? Or... But there is a reason for the loss of their consciousness because of a traumatic event. And they don't remember because it was a traumatic experience. So I begin to understand that he lived the experience of physical death, but there's something that makes him not remember it. And so I'm going to work on what caused him to not remember so that he can remember. I don't need to say, you died. Hey, brother, you died. That's it. What's going on? You're dead. You don't need to say you died. 
You don't need to pretend that he didn't die. So the individual is there drowning, but he's already dead. And then we throw the buoy, the lifeboat, but he's already dead. What are you trying to do with the lifeguard? The lifeguard is for those who are still drowning. If he's already drowned and he's not aware that he died, is the lifeguard the best thing you have to offer him? You're in the dark. I can't see anything. I see a light coming. What light? He's in the dark. We're in the in the lighted place, but your spiritual condition makes him be in that dark. What causes him to be in the dark? What causes him to be stuck in the drowning? What causes him not to have the awareness that died and is still in the hospital or is still there in the concentration camp or is still there in, in the nursing home? It's not because he doesn't go through the experience of death. It's because something prevents him from, the, from recalling it. That's where we intervene. When we intervene, in something that prevents him to, from recalling it, he naturally recalls all those occurrences of his death. Because we're not there to save anybody. We're there to help them have a consciousness of what they are. The knowledge of the doctrine is very important for us to understand how to manage each case. We stopped using the term doctrinary person because, we, because people used to use the knowledge of the spirit's doctrine to sort of like come down on the spirit with it. My brother, you have to forgive. And so it's like an imposition or a condescension. So we stopped using the word doctrinator as somebody who's going to preach the doctrine and instead creating dialoguer or counselor or converser. At the end, the, the terms don't really matter if we, if we don't change the posture. I can be a doctrinary person in the sense of bringing the, pers of bringing the consoling doctrine to those people. I can't be an, an imposing person because what needs to be at the forefront is the loving clarifications. I want to thank you because you've expanded the doctrinary vision of what we said, of the gospel and this, of this ability to have this compassion, this empathy. I believe that a big, a long time during the Spirit's doctrine, people in the Spirit's doctrine were changed to this no thing about the knowledge, as if this was just knowledge in a little box. Because all of this is in the Spirit's codification. We, we were stuck in that easy talk. Example, an individual that is resentful and hates a person. In the Gospel, in the Little Spirit's book, it says, the spring of all evils is selfishness. So I'm not going to say to him, forgive the person. I'm going to try to understand where the selfishness is in order to help them. In the Gospel it says you can't really prescribe faith, so you can't really tell people you have to have faith because it's all there. But we only were stuck in concepts and we were imposing them. And there's a psychological approach that is very deep in the works of Kardec, very both educational and psychological, both perspectives. Because there is this moral education as a perspective, psychological and educational, which we kind of lost. We were kind of stuck in a spiritist doctrine as a bunch of concepts, doctrinary concepts in this pejorative way, and become impositions. And it has nothing to do with the proposal of Kardec, which is of moral education. And that's where I said it doesn't help to change the term doctrinary person versus dialogue or counselor. You've got to change the posture. We did a lot of exercise with our, the counselors in our spiritist house when they begin to start. Because the tendency is they want to solve the problem. Hey, abandon the mask of Jesus Christ because we can't solve the people's problems. The spirit comes. I'm lost. And we go, yeah, but you need to pray. You need to find... How are you lost? Since when? What's happening to you? What's the last thing you remember? I need to understand the whole situation of the spirit in order to know how to navigate and help. 
But in our angst, angst to try to solve, we try to throw a lot of concepts his way, which doesn't help. That's lack of empathy, of care, of attention. Because I lost my children, I'm desperate. And the person says, But calm down, our children are not ours, they're gods. I feel like <laughs> punching a person like that. Have you lost a child to have the idea of what it's like to feel like to losing a child? Did somebody say that those children are not ours? What happened? How are you feeling? Let's understand the problem to understand how to help you with this, dealing with this pain. That's the logic of the Spiritist doctrine used with a love. The mediums that are psychophony, the women especially, are men. The counselors are men, and the mediums that are psychophonic tend to be women. Uh, rationality with the men, that we hope that this rationality is tied to a loving kindness with intuition. And the majority of women are in, are in, in the ostensive mediumship. Interesting. So the criteria of the counselor, the ability to listen. Um, as a counselor, I have to see this criteria. Was I able to listen? The agility of my perception, if I did things that are opportune, if I needed to use complementary therapies, not that I need to use them, or Uh, what was my physical and psychological posture? The ability to listen is tied to careful, focused observation without fear or anxiety. And the ability to give guidance only after careful listening. We already want to provide answers. We want to start talking without having first listened. That's an anxiety of the counselor. We need to observe, we need to ask, we need to be attentive to the problem so that after I can give the, the guidance. Agility of perception means to comprehend the problem before the spirit needs to verbalize it. That's really cool for us to have in mind, to have it as a, the counselor. So when we're very balanced and things are flowing well, the spirit begins to talk immediately, it seems that you can perceive and see the situation. And sometimes there's that pain in the chest, you think there's something to do with a bullet or a shooting, maybe you're going somewhere and it was a different direction. This is important to be aware of, because I see that my perception was more uh, attuned in this work or not. It's a criteria of evaluation. Sometimes you go, my God, I was so blind and lost. And sometimes the medium helps us to say, listen, you were saying things, and it looked like you were saying before the spirit was saying something, and you were already saying, and we see that the counselor was very well connected. Sometimes we're seeing something which has nothing to do with the spirit, and there's some kind of a vibratory change, but the spirit doesn't really leave there enlightened or clarified. So we begin to notice how that works out, how that plays out. I remember a case that really touched me of a, a woman who had been raped. And she came, and then she was crying in a situation, and I was able to capture what was really going on. And she began, when she began to talk, I said, you don't have to start. And then I embraced her and I welcomed her. I, le I helped her understand why she was in that situation. Then we were going deeper into the issue of her suffering. Why are you still suffering? If the superior plane is already there and you had already an awareness that you had died, why are you still in the situation? So they're really entering the problems of the individual. What's causing the situation? And she thought it was a person who was not worthy enough. That's why she had never turned herself to God. So that's the type of approach. 
But then the medium then described that the spirit was so touched to feel welcomed and embraced without having to explain that they were raped, there was a t- t- terrible situation. She was so touched in the spirit by it. But that's like one in a million cases. I speak as it as it seems like Marlon says before. No, 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 no. When the spirit manifests and it doesn't explain, it doesn't want to talk. As if the spirit arrives, I just came here to give you a message. I'm not gonna talk anything. I just came to give a message. How do you approach this? We're very dedicated to the case because there are some, some that come to give messages to the group. There's an insecure group that we can't really take milk out of the rocks because there is no way. There are some spirits that come and give this speech but are in a moment of being emb- embraced. And we need to make some kind of a intervention. Listen, you came here to give a message, but I'm feeling that perhaps there's something more you want to tell us. That's when we start to dig and enter the situation. So each case is different, but this is the situation of, of be able to perceive, to have this perception of each case, because there are spirits that come with a posture of imposition and arrogance of oppression and wanting to to f- cause fear or threaten and you identify that it's a fragile soul that has a wearing a mask and you need to make this approach listen here you don't have to be fooled we know that that behind you there's a person a very fragile soul that needs to be embraced then they get really <laughs> upset they want to kill us we say it doesn't help here, let's meet, let me describe you what's inside of you, the pains of your soul and the need that you have to take care of it. Then the person opens up and is ready to be guided. But that's the ability of the counselor to perceive the, the problem, which is beyond having to verbalize it. I remember a woman that she came, I don't know if she was a prostitute or what, but in a profile very exuberant and showing herself. But in her mind, she she was a very disgusting woman, ugly. But I wasn't seeing her in the characteristics of the spirit. It was a very glamorous woman. You never looked at self in the mirror before? She said, I don't need mirrors. I know I'm wonderful, beautiful, but you really need to check yourself in the mirror. And I know somehow they produce a mirror and she description. The medium didn't even notice, but the description that the giving gave was such a profound shock because she was so hideous. And so she was like rotting, very ugly. It was a huge shock that I was able to capture or grasp. So really, there's no way of knowing before or preparing or in the meeting of a glamorous woman. That woman, yeah, not because I'm Marlon said it, I'm going to bring a mirror. This is the ex- exercise of the de- personal development of learning to provide space to the intuition, to meditation, to happen every day. So that can that can reflect in the mediumistic way. But if I don't have the habit of meditation, harmonization, introspection, the searching for the gospel, then it becomes very hard. Timely, appropriate intervention, what to say, when to say, and how to say. Some spirits are going to have to say. Listen, but you know what happened to you, right? Sometimes you have to say, because they know that they died. We know that they're just rambling and they're trying to camouflage, but they already know. And then there are other spirits that, in fact, don't know that they died. And we need to do some type of intervention. Some, but, but we know, like, yeah, I know, but I'm very difficult. And I can't really accept it because I was a very rich person. I can't accept that I died. So then there you go. This is ability to talk, what to say, when to say, and how to say. We need to evaluate it many times after the communication of the work. How the medium was able to evaluate this uh, performance. Use of complementary therapies, passes, prayer, regression, sleep therapy, hypnotic suggestion. 
it's a hypnotic suggestion I don't know how to use. I don't know what they are talking about with this. Sleep therapy is a great thing because when we don't know what to say, we say, my brother or sister, you're now going to go to sleep. Sleep therapy, I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to induce you to sleep. And Jesus, please help because now we're lost here. We need to know how to use it very well. So have some water to calm down. To be able to use the therapies like or a prayer because many times the individual is a condition of guilt and he's closed in his guilt and he shouldn't have done that because it was an accident or a car accident and he killed himself and he killed a child and he doesn't accept it and we need to say but so did you ask for God for help I don't have courage to ask for God but that's something uh, ask for God don't you're going to stimulate the individual but try God is not going to abandon you because he loves all his children etc we start to stimulate stimulate till the moment comes when he makes the prayer God please help me and that's it the whole panorama changes we are able to in fact prove that God never abandons anybody so in the middle of the communication we work with a prayer or the passive to help the pass there's a, a, a note from this project that are very specific about the pass for when we should do it or not because pass doesn't have to be given at every communication to every spirit but in special when the communication is going through issues because of the medium or when spirits are really going through um, deformed states and a deep, deep, painful affliction, then the passes are a good, a good suggestion. But it's not very often that we need it. About in a hypnotic suggestion in lycanthropy, when they go through animal forms, mm -hmm. disformed, when they're trying to uh, be restored to a human form, Perhaps you're talking to a spirit who's been disformed through some hypnotic suggestions you're able to restore his form. Perhaps I don't have the courage to use it or how to use it. The very majority of cases where I've done with these people of going through for, mm, disformed creatures, I wasn't even aware that I was dealing with a disformed spirit. But when we start to talk or approach, I will feel the inspiration of the, to talk about the presence of God and Jesus. And then later, the medium describes that the forms were changing. I don't know precisely how to or when to do these hypnotic suggestions. But they put it there as a technique, I tell you. Not that in every situation you have to use all these techniques, but I need to know the opportune moment to use each technique. And lastly, the physical and psychological posture. We can't, don't need to get so close to the spirit that's communicating because that can generate some kind of dis-ease or some energetic uh, ill but when the counselor is too close, this diminishes the, mm, the field of action of the medium, which can affect the concentration. So not, not just because of the energy, but if it's too close, I can't really turn my head and I'm going to, and I can hit the head of the, the counselor. We have a woman in our group that she comes very close, very close. And I go, Barry, get away, get away, we can get so close. In these last uh, situations I had, I had the text, we were here, the medium was here, and, the, and, and so we were, she was at the edge of the table, so that she could be a little far away. And when she turned to do a dress, I was looking at her, I went like this, she came back. I'm just talking to the spirit from far away because this doesn't just energetically interfere but for example in the passes whoever gives you a pass if they give, get too close with their hands 
depending on the type of energy, there's some kind of irritation that can happen. Not because it's bad energy, but because there's too much concentrated energy which can cause like itching or something. Same thing for the counselor. If he gets too close, he can cause this kind of interference. So, but that also reduces the field of action of the meeting. If I have to change my gestures, then I will, then I, as a medium, disconnect from the communication. So not too close, a coercion, sometimes, you, but you have to forgive, that's coercion, displaced dis, 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 of like easily distracted. Somebody was a, talking, talking to the, as a counselor, and sometimes I would be the pencil, my brother, and they were like doodling as they were talking to the spirit. So that's very easily distracted, distracted. Insecurity, fatigue. This I need to evaluate in myself. Sometimes I don't notice by my posture. By my posture, I noticed that was that I was tired. Sometimes it could be this question of approaching. Sometimes when the past giver comes to give the past, it's going to get close. Sometimes that can, that can inhibit the medium. It can. You have five more minutes to have any other functions. Are you like crazy to leave? So if you want to leave, do it now because my back is turned to you. recap very quickly. So there's two functions, the director and the assistant. Assistant is the individual who is not the ostensive medium or is a counselor. Is the assistant. He has to have concentration, motivation and irradiation of his thoughts. I think assistance is tough to maintain his concentration because when we're talking, you're busy. Whoever is doing the, the channeling is doing all, but whoever is in the assistance, one hour in, in concentrating is a very tough mental strain. So we evaluate the concentration. The main risk that they can have is of distraction. So here comes the old man who died in the old nursing home. Wow. My grandma died like that too. You think she's aware that she died? So we get lost in our thoughts. And in the meantime, there's that old spirit that needs help. Or the assistant brings a problem. Oh, maybe that spirit is black, or maybe she's white. or So, so they, they bring their own thoughts. So this distraction, like a butterfly going everywhere, it's very tough need a lot of concentration to prevent that. The motivation is interesting because the assistant has a role. They have to be very much involved in the work, but without getting attached to the specific problems. Because when I get stuck to the medium talking to the counselor, uh, they shouldn't really say that. I'm interfering in the communication. I need to be connected to the problem with a certain with, with a certain detachment which is this non-rational involvement I'm like irradiating love to that spirit surrounding him with light and the counselor and the medium and maintaining them motivated knowing that those vibrations I'm sending do make a difference and the motivation is tough to maintain because the individual that feels his least important is the assistant but, but assistant doctors are very good so it's very tough for the individual as an assistant to recognize that they are important in the work because we li they live a lot at the who's connected but if we don't have 
If we don't have a good work from the assistants, then we can't really deal with complex situations because you really need that extra energy and vibration. One case in our work, we had two people that were assistants, <coughs> and there were people. We were a group of seven people. Two as assistants were absent, and we really felt a huge difference in the work. It was the ecstasy of our friends who are assistants. They were so happy when they learned that we said, "Wow, you guys really made a difference. That you weren't there. We missed you a lot." Because we felt it. Our group. We always highlight their importance because it makes a huge difference. We put all the assistants in the group as pass givers. So you're an assistant as a pass givers and, and be able to help. And give them to do the final prayers, etc. Not that it's to have. Mm -hmm. The continuous irradiation of their thoughts. It's tough for us to maintain because of our inability to concentrate. This continuous irradiation of thought and energies. The director of the meeting in the project put four criteria leadership, equanimity, impartiality. Ability to overcome challenges. Both the medium is a practice with the group and the ability to guide in appropriate times. That's hard. But me as a coordinator of the group, I need to evaluate my profile as a leader. If I'm able to, in fact, be a reference for people, if, if when they have doubts, they can come to me and they feel security, safety, if I have enough knowledge, in order to lead these people, equanimity or impartiality, in order to treat people exactly the same, and that's tough because there are some that we like more, and some that we like less, the ones that we like less, we may not treat the same, and sometimes they don't know that we don't like them as much, but they perceive it, <laughs> because we can't really do this equanimity or impartiality, it, it exists exudes from the soul and after you've lived with the group for a while and they were distant from that person in the dynamic it's tough to maintain that impartiality when we did that dynamic two women put me very far away I said oh you two hmm no I did ability to overcome challenges in the mediumistic practice and with the group because sometimes an intervention is needed. Many years ago, I was coordinating a group. The first group that I participated in, I wasn't a coordinator, but when the coordinator wasn't there, I was there. The day that she didn't go, there was a medium who was super obsessed and crazy nuts, and she began to communicate a spirit, and she began to talk things about each person that was there, and very, very sensitive and in, intimate things. At that moment, there was a mother and daughter, and she said, I didn't know what was happening, and she said, and you, who keeps pretending to treat her the way you treat the others, but everybody knows that you don't like her, you like the other one more. And I said, oh my God, where is this going to? So I said, please stop everything. And the, the counselor was trying to, to say, I had to do an intervention. I said to the spirit to shut up. Not like that, but I had to tell him to be quiet. So we need to make some kind of an intervention quick in order, in order for the damage not to be bigger. Sometimes the medium is challenged and the, the counselor is not helping out, then the director has to go. Elder. Elder. Intervention is going to be rare. If you don't have this aspect of leadership, you're going to be intimidated. When, the, when you're going to talk with a counselor, so when it's happening, the dialogue, the counselor sometimes is so involved in the problems of the medium with the spirit that they can maintain this perception of the damage they're doing. Well, sometimes they're lost because the counselor 
in his function, sometimes they're tired or they need to do a little bit of intervention. Time and time again, we do this kind of intervention. How? Example, the spirit is there with like with a good vibe, pretending to be good. And the counselor is trying to but something but, but I'm not talking to you. Oh my god, it's really hard to translate. Uh, sometimes yes, when I notice that the spirit is pretending to be something that they're not, I intervene. Because the counselor sometimes may not be thinking like me. They have his his own approach. As a director, I need to be mindful that I shouldn't have said this, I shouldn't have said that. It's going, there's going to be an approach, but sometimes the counselor might be lost in these times. The director has to go in and do an intervention. I've had cases when the counselor is not able to talk of, of condescending spirits. When we, they were pointing the finger to the, the medium. So that's why we need to have intimacy so that the counselor doesn't feel offended. Sometimes I've done this intervention and the counselor later said, thank God you in got involved because I didn't know what to do anymore. Because we're not there to satisfy the ego of the counselor. We're there to help the spirit. Sometimes I remember that it was a medium that was uh, there doing the counseling and she said the spirit wanted to leave wanted to leave and she said well then if you want to go then go and i said wait 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 don't go yet because i felt that it was not time for the spirit to go and we needed to do another type of approach and we entered there we talked the, the do the approach because we're there to help the spirit in about a case that the counselor feels that he needs help can he signal that he needs help? This first group, I was there. I was very young. I was 16. So when the spirit, I was like, when he was angry, I'm like, please help me, come home. So they would come and help me. Because the first time that, that I wasn't able to handle, I began to argue with the spirit. I finished it. I was so filled with a headache. My head was about to explode. And then I noticed the mistake I made. So we had agreed. When I can't handle it, I'd raise my hand. When I could notice that I wasn't handle it, I was already raising my hand. Another counselor would come and they would take over. Especially when the person is learning, this is has to be so clear. And there's sometimes when we're not really feeling well or we're not able to realize what the spirit is going through. We're there together, so the people are there to help us. Sometimes people, sometimes I get involved, I just maybe say one question or mention some things, and then the counselor and this, and sometimes I get involved and in of a mother, and they say, what about, how about your mother? So the counselor then continues, I just do a quick intervention and I leave. There was a time that we were writing, counselors sometimes, as, as directors, we write notes to each other. And I wrote something, ask the spirit if it was something. But she didn't understand that it was for her that I was writing. So she talked to the spirit, so she asked the spirit, ask him if it's not that. No, I'm sorry, my and what I wanted to ask you is, is she read the little message. Sometimes you make those mistakes, but it's a way to help. The ability to guide in the opportune moment. This because in the group we're going to have to make some approaches. The person was not concentrated say fall asleep and that they they uh, went to the another place you have to know how to say listen you didn't really uh, go anywhere you were sleeping or you need to really make those interventions you need to talk individually because they may feel offended some people I have to talk in person at the time so when and how to approach the group is very important 
It depends on this di director who knows and has a good relationship with all everybody in the group. Who they feel more at ease talking in the group. This person that gets so close, I can I can say everything in front of her. If I said everything, everything, yeah, there are some people that that can't really say these things in front of everybody. Regarding dialogue, when he says how to speak, are you always going to be able to speak with the spirit calmly or, or serene, or can it be harsh sometimes? Depends on the situation, it's on how to talk. Some spirits we have to be firm. There are spirits that we need to be a little more firm or reveal that we're not afraid or some, try, some type of imposition. And there are spirits sometimes. When when you try to impose it or you're not a fear, you, you drain the relationship. So this ability, how to say it, what to say, is very delicate. And I remember a lady who had lived an experience of tremendous suffering and she became very rebellious. The second week she was like rambling that the world is not fair and all these things had happened. And when I saw in the second meeting I the counselor couldn't help, I went there and I did an intervention. Hold on a second. You're describing that the world was bad to you. Why? Were you a saint? But it was like around that. You don't know what I went through. I say, yeah, but I know that I about God. That God is just and good. So if He's permitted you to go through it, there's something behind it. Let's talk about the other story that you're not talking about. Because it's nothing to do with the previous reincarnation. That's when we began to open up in this other story. She. She was saying, people screwed me over, people did this to me, people did this to me, but what did she do to other people? So sometimes we need to do this kind of intervention. But there are spirits that if you make that approach, it's done, it's over. This ability is to know how to say it, when to say it, and what to say. Sometimes we do an intervention that it was inappropriate. Then the medium will tell us, listen, look, I don't think it was appropriate they should have gotten involved. And sometimes we're able to be firm. Listen, you said what needed to be said because it was needed to be spoken. So the medium helps us to understand this intervention afterwards. I, I rather make the mistake of overacting than being afraid of not doing anything at all. And we can always fix later, so I apologize for the mistake. But you don't know my story. And we can say, I say, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know your story. Let's talk about it. It's the importance of listening, right? Because you might take an approach that you think is necessary. But if you don't get the reaction, you might. And you then lose the, the ability to help. We can't really make the mistake halfway through. Yes, that's it, guys. Here's some of the information. The text is printed from the work. Please take these notes with you. There are groups that do these evaluations of the criteria, writing them down in the work itself, that people do evaluation afterwards, each they'll do their own evaluation, but it's important that it these have these registries so that at the end of six months, one year, I can look at how is my, my leadership as a director, how is my impartiality, how was my medium, if the concentration ebbed and flowed throughout the months or the year, if I was able to do better in the first semester versus the second semester, after the person arrived in the meeting, etc. We're able to have a greater analysis of the bigger picture, having the instruments to analyze. If we don't have these instruments to analyze, then it's tough to, to evaluate. Was it good, not good?